Oh great, the Warhammer preview. Hi, my name is Obsessive Converter, and today I want to talk about Jarai Taika. If you've been hiding under a rock a couple of weeks ago, Forgeworld will be their latest Primark model. There's been a lot of talk towards this model, both positive and negative. Some people complained it was an Asian enough, that he looked like Gerard Butler with a ponytail. And don't get me wrong, the model looks gorgeous, and beyond everything I can sculpt at the moment. I fully understand which was their design choice. But what I don't get is why pick this one over the others when there's plenty of better references. These days, GW has worked for having a more diverse range. We've seen it uh, with the Imperial Guards Brew, with the new Black Templars, Sisters of Battle, but for some reason they chose to do the White Scars dirty. In this video, I will try to give him a more Eastern approach, and I will show you the thought process behind the sculpting ahead. The three times I've had, had to sculpt ahead, I used a manual drill as a stand. It gives a good grip and prevents your hands getting too close to it. I went with a 50-50 mix, nothing special, as all I want for now is to build up some mass. In a heroic scale, heads are around 6mm tall, but since this is a primark, I felt like I needed to upscale it a bit. So I believed adding an extra millimeter or two would work well. The sculpting motto is about removing your fingerprints before anything else. Soak it in abundant water so the green stuff doesn't stick to the brush. So let's take a look at the source material first. Before anything, we need to translate his head into the most simplistic shape we can imagine. After a few seconds looking at it, I determined it was similar to a double cone trunk. So I just rolled it over a clean surface, diagonally, to create the basic shape. Once I was happy with the overall shape, the next step is to define the jawline. Since most of it will be covered by the beard, I didn't care much about it. After that, I went to find the cheeks. If we look at Jagetoy's picture, he's kind of sharp in that sense. Notice those two little depressions on there. Next, I took a burnisher and carved two holes where I wanted to place the eyes. The distance between them seems very normal, but it is like his nose is taking a big chunk of his face area. Getting the symmetry right is very important in this step. I don't want an eye higher than the other, or being too close to his nose and the other on his ear. Seems right to me. Moving forward, I will make a very little mark where I want the mouth. Then I went about adjusting a few things. For every time I press green stuff, I will create a reaction somewhere else. It is all about revisiting your work from time to time until it becomes elastic and unable to deform. This seems like a good starting point now, but we're not done yet. Now I'm going to take some glass balls roughly the same size. As usual, every time I open the eyelids, some of them want to break free. Anyways, as I was saying, I will take two of the similar size and use them as eyeballs. Sure, I could be using some green stuff ones, but unless I had pre-built them yesterday, they won't be rock hard at this point. That's why I'm using these ones. I will help them in with my tool and I will call it a day. Now I will save the process and wait until tomorrow. Green stuff is about working in layers. You should learn when it's time to stop and leave it for another day. I don't want it deforming every time I need to stick a tiny bit to it. I didn't want to call this video tutorial because I don't believe there's such thing when it comes to heads. 
sure I can give you some tips, but every head is unique on its own. It is not a technique that can be taught like sculpting wood, scales or cloth. There are a lot of things that factor in, like getting symmetry right, learn to dissect facial features, stuff that can only be learned by either experience or talent. After all, this is a form of art. There's people that will get it right at first try, and others that will struggle a bit more and need a little push. But if you ever believe you are not valid, look at my family hand. I'm not faking it. Yeah, baby. I'm ready to steal some jingle bells this Christmas. Green stuff can be infuriating at times. And to this day, I still struggle with it sometimes. Compared to clay, it is a nightmare to work with. So I don't want you to get discouraged by it. If you ever played Dark Souls, you know what I'm talking about. Learning how to school with green stuff can be some nice thing to watch. Good. I usually like to start this second session by adding the nose. I had to scrap it three times before I got it right. The art is a tricky one on this because I can't tell if it's a pointy one or what. The only thing that suggested to me was this under area that was very sharp. So I chose to go with a traditional Mongol nose. Generally speaking, Asian folks tend to have a little depression in between their eyes, while Westerners have it matched with our forehead. You can see me now shaping a teardrop that will become the nose with my fingers. For the facial features, I like to mix a 60-40 or 70-30 mix, by adding more yellow. It is easier to blend with the rest of the head. In this case, I will add the nostrils individually, but they can also be cut from the main body. I did also add a lower lip by sticking a small cord of green stuff and blending it in only on one of its sides. I also like to fill the space around the eye. In this scale, it doesn't mean much to sculpt the eyelids, as most of the time it will be obscured by the brows. What I usually do is to sculpt some bags under the eyeball. Speaking of brows, the eyes are very pointy. So after blending the eyebrows, I used a needle to push them upwards. Then it was time to raise the cheeks a bit and define those wrinkles. Here's a good close-up of the progress so far. There's nothing to really tell about tears, as anything that looks like one will work. But if I were to say something, be careful for where you are placing them. For instance, Jagatai has his ears on the lower end of his school. I shaped a triangle with my hands and put it under his chin. Then push it aside in the general direction of the wind to create the beard. After that, I would take a string of green stuff and split it in three sections to create a base for the moustache. If it doesn't maintain shape, use the gravity in your favor. And keep revisiting it every couple minutes until it dries to a point, you don't need to keep making adjustments. For the earrings, just cut a small piece of fresh green stuff. We need to be really sticky with this bit as it doesn't have too much of a contact area. For small bits, I would advise you of using white industrial oil as a mean of lubrication, as most likely water would run through everything, making it impossible for the green stuff to stick to anything. Just pour some oil into a piece of paper, dip in your tools, and remove all the excess, as we only want a very small thin coat of oil. If you're going to be using oil with bigger stuff, just remember to wash it with soap, so it doesn't affect the paint when priming. Kinda similar to when you buy resin miniatures. I could say we're almost done sculpting the face, 
So now it's time to start working on the dominoid. I acknowledge it would be a waste of time and resources to try sculpting the shaft. So I took a Chaos Space Marine power axe and cut a piece of the desired length. Then I flattened a small ball of green stuff on top of his head. I used the green stuff as a glue for the top knot, but for sure it would fall when I begin to work on the hair on the next session. So once it dries, it would be intelligent to unstick it and glue it again with super glue. I would not advise you to use super glue with fresh green stuff. Please don't. I chose to let it rest for another 24 hours before moving on. In order to create the wave effect, you need to make three points of contact, or else you will only be pushing the hair up and down. In this case, I will be using one of my fingers as the third point of contact. After I'm satisfied with the curve, I will let it rest until it can maintain shape on its own. Keep looking at it for the next hour or so, as gravity will try to straighten the curve as seen in this sped up section. So halfway through the curing process I started marking the stretch marks in the intersection between the hair and the shaft. When I was happy with the result I chose to let it dry for 12 hours. I could have waited for another day but I wanted to finish it in the same day. The next step is about the sticking strings of fresh green stuff to give some volume to the head and help differentiate the strands better. One of the benefits of not being limited from mold casting is I can add details that any other way they would get trapped inside the mold or become too thin and too fragile to cast. It was time then to repeat the same on the moustache tips. And that was pretty much it. At some point in time I lost one of the earrings, so maybe making them before the top knot wasn't the smartest call. But nothing that can't be easily fixed. Overall I learned a lot through this process. Mind you, it was my third attempt at phases, and the first at making hair. But I believe I shouldn't be flexing as even now I can see a few things that could have been improved. Sculpting is about leaving it at a point you're satisfied with yourself, similar to painting miniatures. And if you ever feel stagnant, it means it is time to make a step forward and try to find mistakes in your previous works, and find ways to fix them. So thanks to everyone for watching this video. If you enjoyed my content, please consider leaving a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We're now close to 500 subscribers. If I reach 1000, I'm going to be doing a giveaway. If you wish to buy me a coffee or do you want some private lessons, check the Patreon down here somewhere. Okay, I'm not good at this. Until next time, Obsessive Converter disappears.